Good evening, everybody. I'm really so happy to welcome you all to the first the kickoff program for our 2023 uh, season. Welcome, everybody. Um, the first order, before I make any other announcements, um, I hope she's not going to be too mad at me, but today is Joan Pierce's birthday. So let's all wish her happy birthday. That's right. My name is Karen Burkhard. I am the Executive Director of the Colorado Springs World Affairs Council. We are pleased to welcome you to today's program, Nuclear Arms Control in Dire Straits. Where's that? <laughs> we're going to ask we're going to ask our speaker to explain that. Um, I want to recognize our sponsors and institutional members. Thank you to the Tiemann's Foundation, the Richard Petritz Foundation, the El Pomar Foundation, University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, Pikes Peak State College, Colorado Springs Chamber and EDC, SEBA Charter High School, and Fountain Valley School. Thank you to all of those organizations for supporting us, and thank you to all of our premium members. Before I turn the podium, thank you. Before I turn the podium over to Sky Forrester, who will introduce today's speaker, please make sure that you have marked your calendars for our annual membership meeting um, at 11 o'clock a.m. on September 7th here at the Pinery. This is the annual meeting of members, which is mandated by our bylaws, and we will be electing new members to the board of directors, and we will also have a brief financial overview as well. This is conveniently scheduled to be held immediately before our program with Steve Sokol at 1130, at which I know everybody is already registered for. And so I really am looking forward to seeing all of you uh, at that annual meeting. So with that, I'm going to invite Sky Forrester to come up to introduce our speaker. Great. Yay. Thanks, Sky. All right. I'm supposed to take this away. Um, it's great. First, it's a great pleasure to see everybody back. This is a wonderful turnout for a great program. Um, I've known Steve for many years off and on in a lot of ways. And... Uh, and I was delighted that he was coming, but I thought, arms control in mid-August, how many people will come? And this is wonderful. Uh, but you're, you're, you're not going to be disappointed. Uh, there's a long bio that was on the website. I'm not going to read it. Steve said, don't read it. But I do have to get it right because I have to give titles right, right? So um, Steve Pfeiffer, Ambassador Pfeiffer, is a non-resident senior fellow in the Arms Control and Nonproliferation Initiative, Stroke Talbot Center for Security Strategy and Technology, and the Center on the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institution, and an affiliate of the Center for International Security Cooperation, CSAC, at Stanford University. <sighs> but that's because Stanford and Brookings had long titles. Um, a long and distinguished career at Brookings uh, and fellow in a variety of fellowships around the world. Uh, but in addition, uh, 25 years in the Foreign Service, a distinguished career. Um, his book, and I'm going to get the title right here, which is an excellent one, I've read it, The Eagle and the Trident, U.S.-Ukraine Relations in Turbulent Times, uh, published by Brookings in 2017, and you'll remember those were turbulent times. And um, uh, he was ambassador to U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, 2000, let me see, 1998 to 2000. He was, uh, uh, let me see, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Eurasian Affairs, uh, in the State Department, he worked Russia, Ukraine, Eurasian issues, and National Security Council, and the list goes on. Um, so there isn't much of anything you can't ask him about that he won't know the answer. Um, but he's actually delighted not to be talking about Ukraine tonight, although I think that might come up. So without further ado, my friend Steve. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, is the microphone working? Yes. 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 Okay, great. Uh, Karen, thank you for the invitation. Uh, Sky, thank you for the introduction. Uh, yeah, it is kind of nice not to talk about Russia and Ukraine, but this is probably uh, equally grim. So I would start out by saying I think that there are two existential, existential threats facing the United States today. One is climate change. The other is a large-scale attack by the strategic forces of the Russian Federation. And unfortunately, we're at a point now where U.S.-Russia relations are at their lowest point in decades, a time where nuclear arms control between the two would make a lot of sense. Uh, but unfortunately, there are problems and not great grounds for optimism. So what I want to do this evening is talk really about three things. Why do we do nuclear arms control? 
Second, I'll give you a history of nuclear arms control from 1960 up until the present. And I'll talk about some of the future challenges and questions. And I'll, I'll do it, uh, hopefully, without getting too much into nuclear wonk language. So let me start with, why do we do nuclear arms control? We do it because it's a tool to advance US national security. One reason is, and this goes back to like the early 1960s, is to enhance strategic stability. And the concept of strategic stability turned on creating a situation between the United States and the Soviet Union in which neither side, either in a crisis or a conventional conflict, would have incentives to use nuclear weapons. And basically what it entailed is each side built up survivable nuclear forces so that they could, you could launch a massive Soviet nuclear strike on the United States. The United States would still have the forces to devastate the Soviet Union in their swamps. And in that situation, presumably both sides had strong incentives not to launch nuclear weapons. So what they did is they put their intercontinental ballistic missiles in, um, in, in hardened silos that protected the missiles from attack, and then also began to put their missiles on ballistic missile submarines, which could go out and hide in the oceans around the world. And so this led to this concept of mutual assured destruction, where the United States and the Soviet Union could each deter each other, because they had the capability to devastate the other one even after a first strike. And, and that's the basis of deterrence, created in the mind of an adversary that the risks and costs of his or actions are far, out, far outweigh any possible gains he or she might help to achieve. And with nuclear weapons, there are huge risks and huge costs. And arms control then was working to look at ways, how do you underpin that and strengthen that deterrence and that stability? A second objective is to reduce the nuclear level of threats, and actually we have made progress. If you go back to the late 1980s, there were about 70,000 nuclear weapons in the world, uh, mostly in the hands of the United States and the Soviet Union. Today that number's down to about 12,000. And again, the United States and Russia, between them have about 90% of those weapons. Uh, this will give you an idea of US and Russian active nuclear warheads. The United States now is about 3,700 and Russia about 4,400, according to the Federation of American Scientists. And just so you'll see this chart a couple times, the dark red, that's deployed strategic weapons. That means warheads that are on active ballistic missiles or weapons at bomber bases. The uh, kind of ugly yellow there, it was a lot better when I put it up there, but the ugly yellow there is tactical or non-strategic weapons, an area that the Russians have always had an advantage in. And then the blue are reserve strategic weapons, which has always been a US military preference. Now, there's about 1,500 weapons on both sides that I did not put on this chart. Those are weapons that have been retired, but have not yet been dismantled. If you had a weapon that's 25 or 30 years old, dismantling it is actually a fairly careful process and it takes some time. But I would argue that even with approximate, these numbers, I mean, used against the other country would be absolutely devastating, so there's room for further reductions. A third objective is transparency, and that is, the more we know about Russia's nuclear arsenal, and the more they know about ours, the fewer worst-case assumptions we make. And, and that can actually save money, but it can also mean fewer weapons. So transparency, this is a picture from the 1987 Treaty on Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces, I'll talk about it a little bit later. But it really provided not only for elimination of missiles, in this case it's an American Pershing II, but actually what Soviet inspectors could come and see that that missile had been eliminated and then afterwards these pieces would be crushed. And, and having that better understanding, in fact, uh, when they testified uh, in favor of the new Star Treaty in 2010, the Joint Chief said, actually as valuable to them as the actual limits on Russian forces was the data exchanges and the notifications and on-site inspections because it said that made the American side much more knowledgeable about how the Russians maintained and operated their forces. And again, that avoided worst-case assumptions. A fourth reason for doing nuclear arms control is cost savings. Uh, this chart shows when you total up the cost, we have to recapitalize the triad. There's a new ballistic missile submarine being built, a new intercontinental ballistic missile, the B-21 bomber, a new cruise missile, but also at the bottom there, the nuclear warheads to arm those systems. And over the next 10 years, we're looking at 800 to 900 billion dollars to support the nuclear enterprise. Now, that means demands on the budget, 
It means there are opportunity costs here, and less money for civilian needs. But even with the in the defense budget, it means less money for conventional forces. So the more of these we buy, you, the fewer attack submarines, the fewer F-16s, the fewer tanks. And I think that's something to bear in mind. Uh, it seems to me that the most likely way that the United States ends up in a nuclear war with either Russia or China is going to be a conventional war that begins, that goes badly, and then one side chooses to escalate. And so what I worry about is while we're doing this, I don't want to shortchange our conventional forces because I would like to have the conventional forces to deter that conventional war in the first place and then avoid the most likely route to nuclear weapons. And then the fifth reason is non-proliferation. In 1970, you have the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Most of the countries of the world have signed that and agreed not to acquire nuclear weapons. The United States and Russia, though having 90% of those weapons, have a responsibility. And one thing the treaty also calls on is those states with nuclear weapons are supposed to be working towards disarmament. <laughs> Now, I don't think a new U.S.-Russia agreement is going to get Mr. Kim here to give up his nuclear arsenal. But what it could do is it gives American diplomacy greater weight to ask other countries to put pressure on the North Koreans. So I think nuclear arms control between Nancy and Russia can have a positive effect on non-proliferation efforts. Now, arms control is very closely related to the concept of nuclear deterrence. And let me just make a couple comments on that. Um, I think if you look at the Cold War, particularly the height of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, nuclear deterrence probably prevented a war. If you go back in history and you look at two countries that were opposed ideologically, politically, militarily, economically as the United States and the Soviet Union, they often end up going to war. I think nuclear weapons, nuclear deterrence probably prevented that. But let me add an asterisk there, which is, at several points during the Cold War, nuclear deterrence worked because we got lucky. Mm -hmm. So in 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis, President Kennedy chose to impose a naval blockade around Cuba and rejected the advice of many advisors to launch an invasion of the islands. We only learned 30 years later at a conference in 1992 that the Soviets, in addition to the missiles they put in Cuba, had also tactical nuclear weapons and we're prepared to use those weapons against American forces had they begun the invasion. Uh, there have also been, as you may have heard sometimes, computer misreadings, things like that, so glitches. So when I look at nuclear deterrence, I say, yes, it's worked, but we've been lucky, and if we're going to be prepared to be relying on nuclear deterrence for the indefinite future, we have to ask ourselves, will we stay lucky? And the cost of bad luck is going to be measured in terms of tens or hundreds of millions of dead. So I'm actually a member of Global Zero. I would like to see the verifiable elimination of all nuclear weapons. I think for the United States, that's actually a pretty good situation. We have friendly neighbors in Canada and Mexico. We have the protection afforded by two broad oceans. We have powerful conventional forces. We have the world's strongest alliance system. Uh, so I look at that world and say, that's actually a pretty good world. Now, I'm also realistic. If you're in Russia and you're situated between NATO and China, you may have a different view. So I, I think it's a desirable goal. I'm not sure if we can get there, but I do think that trying to move to lower levels of nuclear weapons would be in the American interest. Unfortunately, we look at some of these challenges, and, and they're pretty big. So let me talk about how arms control started. Uh, I, I think what really gave the arms control the kickstart was the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis where we came very close to a thermonuclear war with the Soviets. And both sides after that begin to think about, okay, what makes sense here? Very quickly after this crisis, you had the first sort of arms control agreement. It was an agreement to establish a hotline between Washington and Moscow. The idea being that in a crisis, you wanted to have a way for the leadership of the two countries to talk to each other and perhaps sort things out and keep them from spinning out of control. Uh, you then had, it also in 1963, originally between the United States, the Soviet Union, and Britain, the Limited Test Ban Treaty. And what that did is it prohibited nuclear tests in the atmosphere, the oceans, or outer space. So you got pictures like this. This is the Nevada test site. It, testing went underground. It actually didn't affect testing much. And in fact, I think for some reasons, the testers like being underground. So I look at this as less of an arms control agreement and more of an environmental agreement. 
you know, it kept the strontium, the radiation out of the atmosphere, and that was a very positive thing. But also in the mid-1960s, you had both the United States and the Soviet Union. They're building intercontinental ballistic missiles. They're building submarine launched ballistic missiles. Uh, they're also building and beginning to build anti-ballistic missile systems, interceptors to intercept strategic warheads. And the question began to arise, I think first asked in Washington, but a little bit in Moscow too, how much is enough? And Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara at one point said, we've reached the point of diminishing returns where we're, we're adding missiles on and it's not improving our net security. And then both sides came together, they agreed in 1969 to begin negotiations, the SALT talks, strategic arms limitation talks. And in 1972, uh, President Nixon and General Secretary Brezhnev signed two agreements one was the Interim Offensive Agreement. What that limited, uh, it didn't limit missiles, it didn't limit warheads, it limited launchers, it limited silos on the ground and launch tubes on submarines. And what it basically said is as of May, June 1972, we're going to freeze that number. It didn't even define the numbers, there's going to be a freeze. Now, as it turned out, uh, the Russians had significantly more launchers. However, the agreement did not limit bombers, an area of American advantage, and it also did not limit warheads. And so what happened is the United States began to say, okay, our launch is limited. We begin putting more warheads on launchers. So you can see here from 1972 to 1978, about a 50%, 60% increase in the number of American warheads as we begin to put three warheads on a Minuteman intercontinental ballistic missile instead of one. Um, the verification for this agreement was what we call national technical means of verification. These are things like surveillance satellites. There were no agreed inspections or any data exchanges, but and that was the reason why you needed launchers, because at that time with the satellites, you could see silos, you could count submarines. So those were accountable things, and that allowed you to have confidence that in fact you could monitor the treaty. The second agreement uh, was basically the anti-ballistic missile treaty. And it banned the United States and the Soviet Union from having a nationwide missile defense system. It limited each side, basically after the protocol in 1974, to one site where it could have 100 interceptors. Uh, this is the site that the United States built at Grand Forks. Um, the radar still operates. Uh, the, the interceptors were operated from one year from 1974 to 1975. And then the United States said, why bother? I mean, we have 100 interceptors. They've got 2,000 or 3,000 warheads. You know, if the 101st warhead will get through, even if these 100 interceptors work, if there are questions about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's no point. And I, I would make the argument that this treaty was really big for stability because both sides basically said, we're only going to have 100 interceptors to defend ourselves. And if the other side has two, three, four, five thousand 5,000 warheads, you, you're not going to have the chance to launch a first strike and then be able to de defend it all against the response. So that seemed to be moving in the right direction of promoting strategic stability, even if it was not reducing the number of weapons. In 1979, the process continued. President Carter and, and Brezhnev signed the SALT II Treaty, and this actually began to have some complex limits. So it limited each side to no more than 2,250 launchers for intercontinental ballistic missiles, the silos, uh, launchers for submarine-launched ballistic missiles, tubes on submarines, and this also included heavy bombers, and it had some other limits within it. Um, and it actually required modest reductions in the launchers and bombers. I think the Soviets went from about 2,500 down to 2,350. Uh, but it didn't limit warheads. And so again, if you look at 1982, 1986, again, the United States number of warheads goes up by about 4,000 as we put more multiple warheads on missiles and we put air-launched cruise missiles on bombers. Um, and again, this treaty was largely verified by national technical means of verification. Now, SALT II never entered into force. Uh, in 1979, after the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, SALT II was in trouble before the Senate, so President Carter withdrew the treaty. And it was interesting that President Reagan, when he came to office, he had campaigned against SALT II. He said, this is a bad agreement. But when he became president, he adopted what was called the No Undercut Agreement. Is that the United States, for a period of time, would not undercut the agreement. It would not exceed the limits. And that lasted until October 1986, when in fact we produced a new B-52 with air-launched cruise missiles, 
and uh, a young political officer in Moscow, D, delivered uh, to the Soviet Foreign Ministry the, t the diplomatic note advising that we had changed the policy and we were no longer uh, observing those limits. Now, that was sort of a difficult period, but it began to set up what we people would call the Golden Age. And it didn't get off to a good start. So, uh, in uh, the late 1970s, the Soviets began deploying this up in the left hand corner there the SS 20 uh, intermediate range ballistic missile. That caused a lot of concern here. First of all, it had a much longer range than its predecessors. Uh, it was mobile while its predecessors were at fixed sites, but it carried three warheads instead of one. And so in 1979, NATO met, and, and NATO says, we're going to have a dual track decision. We're going to respond to this in two ways. One is we're going to deploy American nuclear armed intermediate range missiles in Europe, including these down here, the Pershing twos. And but we're also going to offer a negotiation track. The United States will negotiate with the Soviet Union to see can we limit these deployments. Uh, the negotiations began in 1981 uh, and uh, really didn't make a lot of progress. Uh, the, the sides were pretty far apart. In 1983, the first Pershing, Pershing two missiles arrived in Germany, and the Soviets break off the start negotiating on intermediate range forces. And they also break off the parallel negotiations on strategic forces. 1984 is really a lost year. 1985, the Soviets say, let's come back and restart the negotiations. And 1985 was kind of a key point uh, because you had two important changes. Uh, one was Ronald Reagan. President Reagan was very big on building up American defenses in his first term. In his second term, though, he became much more interested, can we reduce or perhaps even eliminate nuclear weapons. And on the Soviet side, you had Mikhail Gorbachev. And, and Gorbachev came in and said, basically, this makes no sense. He said, look, we got ourselves in a position where we deploy the SS-20, which can't strike the Americans, and now there are these missiles in Germany, which the Soviets incorrectly thought could hit Moscow. He says, they can take out Moscow in six to seven minutes. That was, that was incorrect, but it was not a bad thing to have the Soviets think. Uh, and so, in November of 1985, Gorbachev and Reagan meet. There's a little bit of chemistry there. Uh, and then in October of 1986, they meet in Reykjavik, Iceland, uh, to talk about nuclear weapons. And both leaders go way beyond their talking points. Uh, and at one point, they come very close to an agreement to eliminate all nuclear weapons in 10 years' time. Um, and it, it, it basically, it falls apart over uh, differences over missile defense. And so at the end of this meeting, you have a very disappointed Reagan, a very disappointed Gorbachev leaving the meeting. It's, it's portrayed in, correctly in the press as a failure. But as the dust settles, people go back and say, well, wait a minute. While the presidents were meeting, there were some side discussions. And they've actually made some breakthroughs on both intermediate range nuclear missiles and also on strategic forces. And so, 14 months later, you have a happy rig and a happy Gorbachev. They're in Washington signing uh, the Treaty on Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces. And, and this was a landmark agreement. In that treaty, the United States and the Soviet Union agreed to ban all land-based missiles with a range between 500 and 5,500 kilometers. That's about 300 to 3,300 miles. And in three years' time, once the treaty enforced, the two countries had eliminated 2,700 missiles, all under intense inspections, uh, data exchanges. Um, there was a, a Russian factory in Volkinsk in the Urals that built the SS-20. It was prohibited from building the SS-20, but it also built some prohibited, permitted missiles. An American inspection team lived at the gate of that factory, and as trains came out, had the ability to inspect each train to confirm that what was coming out was a permitted missile, not a prohibited SS-20. Uh, and, and basically, probably, had, I would say, had the strongest uh, set of verification measures of any arms control agreement done. Now, START-1 uh, took a little bit longer. It was signed by President George H.W. Bush and, and Gorbachev in 1991. And it was a breakthrough because it led to real reductions. So just to give you a sense, Star 2 says the United States and the Soviet Union can each have no more than 1,600 launchers for the intercontinental ballistic missiles and the submarine launch ballistic missiles, 
and heavy bombers. And as you can see the numbers there, both sides have to make a substantial reduction. And then for the first time, the Star Treaty introduced the concept of putting limits on warheads. Now, this was attributed warheads. So this is how they derived it. They said a Minuteman III can carry three warheads. So every silo that we see that has a Minuteman III in it, we assume there's a Minuteman III there, and that counts as three warheads. So it was really a maximum limit. But even there, you're talking about a cut of 40 to 45 percent of warheads on both sides. So real reductions and also very uh, intrusive verification measures, including on-site inspections and data exchanges. Now, um, six months after the treaty is signed, uh, the Soviet Union collapses. So in May of 1992, uh, the United States signs the Lisbon Protocol with Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Belarus, in which the four post-Soviet states agree to take on the obligations of the Soviet Union, and moreover, Ukraine, Belarus and Kazakhstan agree to give up all the strategic offensive weapons that Russia will remain the only strategic nuclear weapon state. Now, later on, about a year after this, there was a START II treaty signed actually just before uh, President uh, Bush uh, finished his term. Uh, it got caught up in differences between Washington and Moscow in the 90s and actually never entered into force. But there was one other agreement that was done at the end of uh, 1996, which was probably when the Golden Age was at its peak, and that is the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty was signed, which banned all nuclear tests anywhere. Now, in 2000, 2001, uh, President George W. Bush came to office, and he was not especially focused on arms control. I mean, his argument was, the United States and Russia were not adversaries, we don't need these complex treaties. Um, now, Putin really wanted a treaty. And so you did have, in May of, 19, of 2002, Putin and Bush signed the Strategic Offensive Directions Treaty. Uh, I tend to be a bit skeptical about that agreement. Uh, it fit on two pages very comfortably. Uh, the Stark I Treaty in 1991, or the New Stark Treaty in 2010, those are each four to 500 to 550 pages long. Uh, because they have things like agreed definitions, counting rules, verification measures, and the SORT Treaty had none of that. So it, I, it was, to my view, it was not verifiable. Um, and it appears that the Americans and the Russians did not even count the same things. Uh, now, the Russians were not happy that they got a treaty that just limited operational warheads. It didn't limit missiles or bombers. And so when President Obama comes to office, you know, he wants to start another negotiation. And he says, we're prepared to go back to that old structure, limit not just warheads, but also missiles and bombers. And so in 2010, uh, Obama and then Russian President Medvedev signed what we call the New START Treaty, the New Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. This was a really fast negotiation. It took about a year. And it took about a year because the head negotiators basically agreed, look, when we have an issue that was solved in the START I Treaty, let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's just take the language out of that, cut it out, and paste it in. Uh, so they got the agreement done within a year. And it was a series agreement with some significant cuts. So this is actually the data exchange from September 20, 2022. We have the last data exchange that's been done. But the treaty said each side can have no more than 700 deployed strategic delivery vehicles. And what that counts is an ICBM in its silo can be launched quickly, that's deployed. A submarine launched ballistic missile in a submarine launch tube, that's deployed. And then heavy bombers that are not trained or maintenance are considered deployed. So 700, you can see both sides below that number. The second limit here, 800 deployed and non-deployed launchers. Well, that counts. A non-deployed launcher would be an ICBM silo that has no missile in it. And the US Air Force, uh, somewhat north of here, maintains about 50 silos that are empty. They don't count towards the 700 limit, but they count towards the 800 limit. And you'll see the United States is right at 800. The Russians are going to be below. And then the last, what I would regard as the most important limit, is deployed warheads. And here's where I have to introduce the concept of arms control math. Uh, the limit is no more than 1550. 1550 is not really 1550. It's more like about 1750. And that is because what that limit counts is, that counts the actual number of warheads on deployed intercontinental ballistic missiles, the actual number of warheads on deployed submarine launch ballistic missiles. However, when you get the heavy bombers, Neither the United States nor Russia maintain weapons on their bombers. 
So the negotiators said, we will count each bomber as one weapon. And that's where a bit of an undercount, I think the U.S. basically assigns about five weapons to each of its bombers. But still, these numbers here are numbers that we haven't seen since the 1960s. And again, verification by national technical means, uh, verification of their data exchanges, besides we're doing 2,000 notifications a year, and, and up to, I think it was 18 on-site inspections a year. And the on-site inspection, you needed that to confirm the deployed warhead number. I'll come back to that in a moment. So that was 20, 2011, and that's when some troubles began. So let me just go back and say, okay, this picture here just to remind you of what the U.S. and Russian arsenals look like in 2023. This is the estimate of the Federation of American Scientists. It's unclassified, but these guys have been pretty good. I mean, when, when the U.S. government was announcing, for example, numbers of warheads in the U.S. arsenal, which they did for a number of years, they were within about 10%. Um, problem number one, is world nuclear arsenals were actually not going down after 2011. So this, now that you'll see a large number of the United States and Russia, this one includes those 1,500 wars on each side that have been retired but not yet dismantled. But what you see is while the United States was going down, Russia, North Korea, China, India, Pakistan going up, and even Britain going up. And that was a problem. A second issue broke out in, in 2014 when the Obama administration said, we believe that the Russians have violated the 1987 Treaty on Intermediate Range Nuclear Missiles. They had begun testing the Intermediate Range Missile. And then later on, the suspicion was they'd actually begin deploying it. Now, the Russians said, no, 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 we haven't done that. Uh, you Americans can come and see it, and we'll show you. Now, what they showed... Actually, the Americans didn't go there, uh, boycotted it, but the press went there. They showed that canister up there on the top left. And I have no idea what's in it, but they said, see, we've shown you a 9M729 missile that clearly can't go more than 500 kilometers. And so they said, well, that actually, we don't know that. Uh, this map down here just shows you that if a nominal range of 2,000 kilometers, that missile could hold at risk a lot of targets in New York, Asia, and the Middle East. Now, the Obama administration tried and failed to persuade the Russians to come back in compliance. The Trump administration um, didn't really try. Uh, at the Trump administration, there was actually American interest in Asia having American medium range missiles. And so the Trump administration withdrew from the treaty in 2018. Uh, I agree that we couldn't have had the United States stay in compliance with the treaty while the Russians were violating it forever. But I do think that the Trump administration could have done some things that might have had a chance of bringing Russia back into compliance, but also would have made it clear that when the United States withdrew, the fault was with the Russians. Third Trump problem was China. And then in the last several years, uh, we noticed that the Chinese are building about 300 silos for presumably for missiles, probably intercontinental ballistic missiles, out in Western China. And so China, which for years had been a kind of a second-tier nuclear power along with Britain and France, about 300 total nuclear warheads. warheads. Uh, the projection now by the Defense Intelligence Agency is that that number could increase to 1,500 by 2035. And for the first time, that raises a question from the United States is, if you have Russia as a pure nuclear weapon state and China approaching pure status, how do you deter, deter two countries? You know, when, when China had 300 warheads, basically, if you have enough to deal with Russia, that's sufficient. But now there's this other question that's more complex. And then the fourth question, uh, problem came up with the New START Treaty begin to hit Trump problems. Uh, the Trump administration approached it, didn't really secure extension. The treaty was supposed to expire in 2021. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, 2021. And, but the Biden administration came in and immediately agreed with the Russians. We'll extend that treaty to 2026. That was a good thing. And people like me looked at it and said, even when U.S.-Russia relations are difficult, it seems in 2021 and even in 2022, after huge differences broke out between Washington and Moscow over Ukraine, both sides seem to recognize there's a common interest in keeping our strategic nuclear competition limited and keeping the New START Treaty in place. And that lasted until March or February this year, when Vladimir Putin announced that the Russians would go through, they were going to suspend their participation in New START. Now, set aside the fact that there was no provision in the New START Treaty for suspension, 
Uh, if you want to leave it, you withdraw from it. Uh, but the next day, then the Russian foreign ministry said, we are suspending our participation. We will continue to observe the three numerical limits, those numbers there, but we will no longer do data exchanges. This was the last data exchange in September of last year. The March one did not happen. We will no longer do the notifications, and we will no longer allow on-site inspections. Um, and as I said, I, I think American national technical means are pretty good. The first limit, 700, 800, we can probably monitor without notifications and on-site inspections. The longer we go without on-site inspections, though, the less confidence we're going to have that the Russians, in fact, are observing that 1500 limit, 1550 limit on deployed warheads. Uh, and so with New START now sort of in abeyance, there really is no functioning nuclear arms control arrangement between Washington and Moscow. So looking forward, uh, there are some difficult issues, some real challenges out there. Now, there was hope in 20, 2011. So in 2011, the United States and Russia had signed the New START Treaty. And people like me were saying, the next logical step is a U.S.-Russia agreement which covers all their nuclear warheads. Uh, and this chart is a chart actually from a proposal that a colleague of mine at Brookings had had. He said, look, um, why don't we go, if you take the U.S.-Russia level and the now, and say each side reduces to no more than 2,000 total nuclear warheads with 1,000 deployed strategic. So each side has 1,000 deployed strategic, so that would be a cut of about 50% under what New START allows. And then for that extra 1,000, the sides can choose what they want. The Russians may want to have more tactical weapons or non-strategic weapons. The U.S. may want to have more uh, reserve strategic weapons. It's up to them. And the Obama administration in 2000 you know, made some suggestions like this. They didn't have these numbers, but the idea was, let's negotiate an agreement between Washington and Moscow that covers all U.S. and Russian nuclear weapons. And the Russians were just not interested. Uh, the Russian, and I think actually the Russians today are probably less interested. The reason being, uh, you know, it, to put on my Russian-Ukraine hat, if you look at Russian conventional forces over the last 18 months, it's been a staggering underperformance. And I think the Russian military now says, we need those non-strategic nuclear weapons more than ever because our conventional forces wouldn't do so well against China or, or NATO. And so that's probably going to be get, make it harder to get Russia to take this kind of approach. And while Washington said we would like a new negotiation covering all nuclear weapons, the Russian interest is more on, we want to limit missile defense, and worried about long-range, precision-guided, conventional strike weapons. So let me talk about those two issues first. Um, first of all, U.S. missile defense. Right now, we have 44 of these things. They're called ground-based interceptors. There are 30 in Alaska, 4 in California, and they are designed to protect the United States against an intercontinental ballistic missile attack. The policy right now is to defend against rogue states. What the United States says is we don't have the capacity to defend against a Russian attack or a Chinese attack, but these might help against North Korea. And uh, in addition to this, there are other missiles, SM3s, BADs, which can intercept lower range missiles, but this is what protects the American homeland. Um, I tend to worry about this, but the Russians say this thing undermines stability. And the Russian concern is that uh, if the United States develops a larger missile defense in a crisis where the United States reach a point where it might think we could do a first strike and our missile defenses could handle whatever's left. And that Russian concern went up in 2002 uh, because the George W. Bush administration made the decision, I think it was a mistake personally, to withdraw from the anti-ballistic missile treaty. And, and that the Russians said, well, wait a minute now, we've opened up the missile defense area. The Chinese are also concerned about missile defense. Although, I would say at this point, neither side in Russia and China has a reason for serious concern. The numbers just don't work. But they say, what about the future? What if the Americans continue to build missile defenses? Now, I tend to be a bit skeptical about this kind of missile defense, and I'll give you a brief explanation of why. Those ground-based interceptors in that picture, they cost about 70 to $75 million each. In 20 years of tests, they hit the target about 55% of the time. A lot of outside critics say, well, sometimes those tests are designed to succeed. Oh. So in one case, somebody said, well, you know, we did one of those tests, 
And there was a transponder at the target. And the North Koreans are probably not going to put a transponder in their warhead in real life. Uh, so we said, let's say if your goal was to have a 90% chance of intercepting the target. So let me take the model I talked about. The North Koreans launched one ICBM warhead at Seattle. In order to have a 91% chance of defending Seattle successfully, we have to launch three ground-based interceptors. So the cost is $210 million. Now, let me say, I like Seattle. It's a beautiful city. <laughs> it's worth $210 million to save Seattle from a nuclear attack. But it gets more complicated uh, because very early on, the United States and the Soviet Union developed decoys, and the North Koreans may have decoys. And in some cases, decoys are just balloons. Because in space, a balloon will travel as fast as a warhead. There's no air resistance. And the Pentagon has said in the past, one of their most difficult challenges is how do you discriminate between a real warhead and a decoy? So if there's one warhead and five decoys coming, and we can't tell the difference, we have to use 18 interceptors to engage each one of those to have that 91%. And then the chance and the cost of them to in Seattle goes to $1.26 billion, again with a 9% chance that we lose Seattle. Now again, Seattle is worth $1.26 billion. But here's the thing. The Russians, the Chinese, the North Koreans, for $1.26 billion, they can build tens of warheads. They can build hundreds of decoys. And so what I worry about this is, if we're getting that offense-defense combination with this defense, we're going to lose. We're going to run out of money. Now, this is a very simple, simplified model, but I think it it's one of the reasons I have concerns that we not go too far too fast down to these kinds of interceptors, because I think at the end of the day, it will be expensive and we won't really buy much security. Now, some future point, you know, maybe when we get to ground-based directed energy weapons that can fire quickly with great accuracy, missile defense may make some sense, but I think we have to be careful about this now. Uh, second issue that's out there, long-range conventional strike. Going back to the 1980s, the United States has developed sea launch cruise missiles and air launch cruise missiles. These are conventionally armed, but, and they've been used. They've been used in Afghanistan. Uh, they've been used uh, in Syria. They've been used uh, uh, in, uh, in Iraq. Um, and they're pretty accurate. And the Russians began talking about 12 years ago, saying, well, you know, these things are so accurate, they can actually destroy targets that used to require a nuclear weapon. I mean, if you could put, and, and I've had this conversation with Russia say, what if an American cruise missile hits a Russian silo head on? Uh, they said that could destroy it. Now, essentially, I talked to people in the American Air Force to say they actually don't think it would be that effective. But you know, there's that debate out there. But there's that Russian concern, and so the Russians would now like to perhaps bring these into the negotiation and add to this new level of complexity. So this is, I think, something if and when I hope it's when we get back to a U.S.-Russia dialogue on strategic stability and perhaps a new agreement we're going to have some really difficult issues. So for example, if the Russians were to say, we will limit all nuclear warheads if you Americans agree to limit missile defenses, I see Piper would take that deal in a heartbeat. That would be usually controversial in Washington, in the Senate. Uh, and so that's one problem. If you start talking about these things, all of a sudden you have a negotiation that's going to be going to take a lot of time and I worry that we're not having that negotiation now uh, because the sides are going to have to deal with questions that they have not previously had to face. So, for example, were the Russians to agree, we will limit all nuclear warheads. Now, right now, we, we limit nuclear warheads based on the fact that we're on ballistic missiles in silos on Soviets, and we know where those are. If you're going to limit all warheads, you have to talk about how do you limit warheads by going into storage areas, things like that, and the warheads can be hidden. So it's a whole difficult set of challenges, and unfortunately right now we're not trying to address those. The second question out there is how do you deal with China? I mean, China's now expanding this nuclear force. There was a suggestion, well, maybe you could have a multilateral negotiation. And the UN Security Council permit by that is the United States, Russia, China, Britain, and France. They've had a nuclear dialogue going on about 10 to 12 years now. It hasn't made a lot of progress. They've developed a glossary of agreed terms. They've had some discussions on risk reduction. But nobody's talking about what a multilateral negotiation would look like. 
I think the multilateral negotiation will be really, really hard. So this gives you in red the number of Russian, US, Chinese, French, and UK warheads as of now. Again, I'm not counting those 1,500 on the American and Russian side that are awaiting this family. And then in the dark blue, well, China will be in 2035. And so when China's down here, we could kind of ignore them. When China's up there, it's going to be really hard. But the question is, how do you get a negotiation among five countries with equal limits? Will the United States and Russia be prepared to go down to British and French levels? Probably not. Are they prepared to let everybody come to their levels? No. So I don't think at this point a multilateral negotiation works. Uh, I think you probably, in the American case, maybe parallel negotiations, U.S., Russia, and U.S., China. Now, maybe among these five countries, if you're not talking about numbers, there needs to be some things that you could do. Could you talk about risk reduction measures? So the United States and Russia have an agreement which halfway still applies. They notify each other of test launches of intercontinental ballistic missiles and Soviet launch ballistic missiles. And that way, when you see this missile blasting on the ocean, okay, that's a test. We were told about it. Russia and China have the same agreement. Well, could you get all five of these countries to agree they would notify each other so that everyone would know about it? Could you go and talk about enforcing norms? It's been almost 80 years since nuclear weapons were used militarily against Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Could you find ways to bolster that federal norm? Is that nuclear weapons shall not be used? And that might be a discussion among the five, but the numbers are going to be hard. Now, another area I worry about is the possibility that of resumption of nuclear testing. That's going to be a challenge. The Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty was agreed in, in 1996. The United States was the first signatory, and only North Korea has tested since 1998. But there's some science to worry. The United States Senate in 1999 refused to ratify or consent to ratify the, uh, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. And there were two main reasons. One reason they said is if we can't test, how do we sure that American nuclear weapons are reliable? And second, how do we know that people aren't cheap? Uh, and that, those were good questions to ask. Uh, the uh, late George Shultz, the former Secretary of State, he made the argument in 2014, 2015, he said, you know, if you're in the Senate, you were right to vote against ratification in 1999. You know, you're wrong now to vote for it now. Because the United States has this program, the Stockpile Stewardship Program, where supercomputers and some really interesting machines. I got to see one of them. I could not begin to tell you how it works. Uh, but they basically allow the directors of the three national nuclear laboratories of Los Alamos, Sandia, and Livermore, and the commander of strategic command each year to certify the pre to the president that the nuclear arsenal is safe, secure, and reliable. So that's, I think, we've solved that problem where, and I had a chance to talk to uh, the director of the National Labs a few years ago, and he basically said, as long as we have funding for this program, I'm sure, I'm confident that we can actually, for the indefinite future, have confidence in our weapons without actually having to test them. Uh, the other thing that's happened is techniques for detecting illegal tests have improved. Not only have U.S. the systems that are largely classified improved, but under the agreement, uh, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization has 300 monitoring stations around the world. And they basically believe that they can detect a test of more than one kiloton fairly easily. So when the North Koreans have done tests, about eight or ten of these monitoring stations have reported very, very quickly. So I would argue that the reasons that people had concern about the test ban treaty 20 years ago are now largely addressed. Uh, and, for example, China has not ratified the treaty. The Chinese say, we will ratify which the Americans do. And so American ratification might give a boost to other countries joining the treaty. But I would give two other reasons why I think this is a treaty we ought to ratify. One is if you look historically, the United States has conducted about as many nuclear tests as the rest of the world combined. And the other one is just a personal anecdote. Um, in 1988, uh, I was in Moscow at the embassy, and I took an American team out to the Soviet nuclear test site. Uh, and we were at one point shown a, a site that they prepared for an upcoming nuclear test. It was a hole about three feet wide, and it went down about a thousand feet. And there was a guy from the Nevada site, and he's behind me, he says, boy, they're going to be surprised when we bring them to Nevada next month. 
I said, why is that? He says, well, they drill their vertical shaft three feet wide. We typically drill our vertical shaft eight to 12 feet wide. And I said, why would you do that? The weapons are not that big. And he said, it's not about the size of the weapons. It's about having maximum security area, maximum area in the silo above the weapon to hang instruments. You know, we have like five to seven times as much space for instruments as the Russians would do on their tests. And so I look at this tree and says, this kind of tree, this is a great arms guy. I mean, this locks in an American nuclear advantage. You know, why would we not want it? But I think it's going to face some challenges. Other challenges out there are third countries. Uh, can we find a way to deal with North Korea? Uh, how do we deal with Iran? So there's a lot of problems out there. But when I look at all those questions, I would say my main concern is still this, is that if we're not careful, uh, we're going to end up in an arms race with both the United Russia and China, both on offensive and defensive sides. And you can already see this beginning to build up, is uh, a former colleague in the government who I respect but I often disagree with, has basically said because of the China problem, the United States should now withdraw from the new start pretty formally and go from 1550 to 3,000 to 3,500 warheads. Uh, the uh, think tank at the Lor at uh, Lawrence Livermore lab came out with a report where they said to deal with the Russia-China problem, we have to deploy more American warheads, and you probably have to Amer add to American missile defenses. And I look at this and I say, okay, that works, but neither my former colleague nor the report say, what do you think the Russians and Chinese are going to do? If we build up, I fear they're going to build up, and we may get back into this cycle that we were in the 1960s where you have all three countries building offensive forces, building missile defenses, but we're reaching a point where we're past diminishing returns. We're spending money that is not buying additional security. So I think as the United States thinks through how to deal with this Russian China challenge, we've got to be careful. We've got to give it some careful consideration so that we don't get into a place that we don't want to be. So I'll just close by saying, unfortunately, I think arms control is in troubled times. Uh, we have efforts between the United States and Russia now on pause. And I do suspect at some point we will recall the lessons we learned in the 1960s that started the arms control enterprise and nuclear weapons. But arms control has a lot to do, and I think the challenges seem to be growing faster than our ability or effort to deal with them right now, and I hope that situation changes. Mm -hmm. So let me stop right now. I would be happy to take questions. So if you guys just want to raise your hands, and I'll bring this to you. Can you tell us uh, what the objection was to Bush W, um, a missile, uh, a certain type of missile in Europe that yeah. really pissed the Russians off? Right. Yeah. Uh, the, the Bush administration in like 2005, 2006, I showed you those ground-based interceptors. The plan was to put a variant of those, uh, 10 of those in Poland, and then a radar in the Czech Republic. And in 19, 2006, the Russians said, look, we don't like that. They said, we will offer to make available our radar data to you so that you, and our radars look south towards Iran. That was the main concern. Uh, and the Bush administration said, fine, we'll take that, but we're still prepared to go ahead with the 10 interceptors in Poland and then the radar in the Czech Republic. When the Obama administration came to office, they looked at the missile defense program and said, you know, this really doesn't deal with the kind of threat we see from Iran. So they canceled that program and they said, we have this what's called the phase adaptive approach. And it was interesting, the regions and Russians kind of welcomed that. But the first phase was having three or four American destroyers that had some interceptors in the Mediterranean. And then what I think really got the Russians was, in phase two, putting 24 interceptors in Romania, and then they're now building a second site for 24 interceptors in Poland. And the Russians argue that these interceptors can intercept Russian intercontinental ballistic missiles. I, I think that's hogwash, uh, because Russian intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missiles will be flying north over the North Pole. And so if you're firing an interceptor from either Romania or Poland, you have, you have to chase. They don't have the range, they don't have the speed. Uh, but this has become one of these that have become all wrapped up in complexity. And what the Russians now say is, well, we think in some of those 
It, it, there are 24 launch cells in Romania. We think some contain offensive missiles. And here, there's a, there's a basis for this, which is that what the U.S. military did was they took what's called the Mark 41 launcher. The Mark 41 launcher is standard on American destroyers and cruisers, and it can carry an interceptor like the SM3 interceptor, which is now in Romania. But it can also carry a, an attack cruise missile. It can carry other offensive missiles. And the Russians say, how do we know there's not something else in those launchers? That would actually have been, and I've talked to people in both the Trump administration and the Obama administration said, look, if the Russians would get reasonable on some of our concerns, we could solve those problems. You could take the Russians that site, you can open up all 24 of those tubes, and they go and say, oh, yes, that's an SN3, it's not a cruise missile. Uh, but that's become an issue that's been pretty badly, badly bangled, and it's created to this sort of bad taste on both sides. Do you think, in retrospect, Ukraine giving up nuclear weapons was a mistake? Yeah, it's a tough question. Um, and it's one that uh, I heard about a lot in 2014. I, my last visit to Ukraine was about three weeks before the Russians invaded in 2022. And I heard a lot about it because I helped negotiate the demilitarization of Ukraine. And I think there, the, the first point I would make is um, I was told uh, and wrote about it in a couple of, in a paper and a book. Um, the Ukrainians in sometime in probably 1992, and the Ukrainian policy going back to 1990 was we will be a non nuclear weapon state. Uh, but they apparently had to be uh, top military, top foreign policy, and security people. And the question was if we change that policy, uh, could we maintain an independent nuclear weapons capability? And the main problem that Ukraine had was. All of the warheads, you could do some very basic stuff on the warheads to maintain them in Ukraine. Anything beyond that, they had to go back to facilities in Russia. And what I was told was at the conclusion of this meeting, they were, the, the military group, they said, one, we don't have the facilities to maintain the warheads. Two, the warheads, Soviet warheads tended to have a much shorter lifespan than American warheads. A number of these warheads are reaching the end of their service life. And three, to build the facilities. And I think Ukraine certainly had the technical capability to build those facilities would cost billions and billions of dollars at a time when the Ukrainian economy was in free fall. So I think that was one point. The other thing was, had Ukraine tried to keep nuclear weapons in the early 1990s, uh, my guess is that the kind of relationship that developed between the United States and Ukraine, between Europe and Ukraine, would not have been possible. They may not have been ostracized like North Korea, but it would have been a very cool relationship. And it would have economic consequences when Ukraine went to the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank. The loans they liked would have found that Western executive directors were voting against them. So, yeah, it's, I, I can, and, I, and having said that, I can see the Ukraine say this was a mistake. That had we had nuclear weapons, the Russians never would have done what they did in 2014, and certainly not what they did in 2022. <laughs> Part of the problem was we, and when I say we, I mean collectively we in Washington and we in Kiev, uh, in 1993, 1994, we were dealing with Boris Yeltsin. Yeltsin had a lot of flaws as Russia's president, but he accepted the fact that Ukraine was an independent country. Uh, we did not foresee Vladimir Putin or what he would do in 2014 or 2022. Had there been, I think, a real fear in Ukraine or a real foresight that this was going to happen, uh, the denuclearization of Ukraine might not have happened. But that would have, I think, created a whole array of issues. And it prevented things like, I mean, for example, NATO was getting, I think, fairly close to saying, we agree Ukraine should be a member on a fairly definitive timeline. That would not have happened with the country that was trying to keep nuclear weapons. So it's a, they're, they're both sides of that argument. <laughs> I just make one last point, and this is also an issue where I think American and Ukrainian perspectives differed. These weren't tactical nuclear weapons, short range stuff. I mean, these were weapons that were designed, built, deployed to destroy American cities. So there was, apart from the Ukraine, I mean, there was an effort, American just in getting rid of these things. <laughs> 
Thank you, sir. Um, that was a lot of uh, useful information in a really short period of time. Um, I'd like to go back, though, to that. You don't have to go back to the slide, but there was a slide you showed really early on that had to do with the cost yeah. of different types of weapons. And your line across the bottom showed that nuclear weapons were really expensive compared to um, a whole host of conventional ones. And you said something on the order of you worried that if we spend too much on nuclear weapons that we won't have sufficient amount for our conventional ones. And it seems to me you are describing, in a sense, what's happening in Ukraine, I mean, with Russia and Ukraine now, that is, Russia's invaded Ukraine, their conventional military is faltering, and so we're getting threats of using not only um, not only tactical nuclear weapons, but we heard jokes about um, in seven seconds, London could be no more yeah. and so forth. So as, is Russia reaching the point where there's a motivation for them to yeah. use nuclear weapons, given how badly their conventional yeah. military is performing? Yeah, no, this is that chart. I, again, I think in the 60s and 70s, the big concern was what they called the bolt from the blue. Well, one day our readers might light up and Sharon and Matt here might say, we have like 2,500 Soviet warheads incoming. I don't think that that's a realistic, I don't worry about that now. But again, I worry about, you know, it, it, we, want to, we want to deter a conventional war because if that conventional war begins, then I believe the risk of when one side or the other begins to lose, nuclear escalation becomes a much more likely path. Uh, but your nuclear threat thing, I mean, yeah, I think we have to worry a little bit when Russians talk about things going nuclear. Uh, bear in mind that a lot of this comes from television pundits, and, and these guys, quite frankly, are, are almost certifiable. Uh, it's, no, no, I'll give you one time. Uh, actually, it was interesting. Uh, there's a Russian general uh, who I've dealt with in track two, track two or, or unofficial cut discussion. I've dealt with him for 15 years. and. You know, he, he sits there a lot, he doesn't say much. But at one point, somebody was saying, well, yeah, we'll start a nuclear war and we'll control it. And he just said, you're crazy. And once a nuclear war starts, you're not going to control it. And he basically said, and if you use a nuclear weapon against Berlin, Paris, and London, what do you think happens to Moscow an hour later? Uh, so there's a lot of crazy stuff being said that I, I just look at them and think these people are they ought to be locked up. <laughs> the more thing I worried about was in September of last year, where I think Putin was trying to make a nuclear threat. And uh, you may recall, at the end of September last year, Putin says, we are annexing Zaporizhia, Kherson, Donetsk, and Luhansk, Oblast, provinces of Ukraine. And what I think the Russian intent was to say, these are now parts of Mother Russia. If new Ukrainians keep trying to fight for these territories, you know, this is a new risk. We will defend these with all means at our disposal. And people said, is he talking nuclear? Now, I think several things happened. First of all, the Ukrainians said, who cares? We're going to keep fighting to liberate our territory. I mean, the Ukrainians already see this as an existential fight. Uh, and Russian tactical governments, I do not believe, would change. Uh, there was a poll that was conducted, and it was like, 94% of the Ukrainians said we should fight to drive the Russians out. And they said, what if the Russians use tactical nuclear weapons? 94% fell to 18%. So it didn't change the Ukrainian determination over the territory. The West responded by basically saying, if you do that, there will be severe consequences. Stop. And, and, not, and then let the, war, let the Russians try to figure out what those consequences were. But I think what probably caught the Russians by surprise it was the Chinese and the Indians who began to say no. And you saw negative reactions coming from the global south. Now, Putin is ostracized in the West now, but I do think that if Putin used to use nuclear weapons now, he would find himself a true international pariah. And what I saw, I wrote about this in November, is that it seemed that in October and early November, the Russians began ratcheting down the rhetoric. So at the end of October of last year, uh, Putin appears before this thing called the Valdai Discussion Club. It, it used to be a, a large group of Western uh, people who followed Russia. It's now mainly uh, from the Third World. 
But he's asked by one of the uh, questioners, well, what about your nuclear threats? And he says, we don't make nuclear threats. That's not in our policy. Our doctrine is very clear. We don't preemptively threaten these nuclear weapons. And these, you know, this is the West trying to tarnish Russia's good image. A week later, uh, the Russian foreign ministry comes out with a statement on preventing nuclear war. And it's about 90% of what we in the West would like to have seen. Uh, and then at Bali, when you had the G20 summit, Putin didn't go, but Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister, is there. And he agrees to language which in paragraph four says, uh, we, the G20, agree that threats or use of nuclear weapons are unacceptable and admissible. And I think I read that as the Russians recognized one, the nuclear threat was not working on either Ukraine or the West. The West was still providing arms to Ukraine. And it was causing them problems with audiences that mattered in China, India, and the global south. So I, I worry a little bit, but I think the Russians you know, probably understand that there would be huge political, economic, and military consequences to that. Thank you. I feel like I might be missing something fundamentally here. The, the number of nuclear warheads is truly staggering. And if, I mean, you just mentioned, you know, a couple on Paris, a couple on New York, would be devastating. Why do we have, why do we feel we have to have thousands and thousands of warheads when a relatively small number could start World War III? Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's an excellent question. I mean, the numbers that we now have, and there's a, one issue which, let's see, I mean, I, I think these numbers are far beyond what they accept for the United States and Russia. Um, again, we've made a lot of progress. I mean, these numbers are probably one-fifth of what they were in the 1980s. So we're coming down. Uh, I would still argue that these numbers are pretty high. And if you go back to some of the discussions in the 1980s about nuclear winter, a portion of these weapons, you know, and we're going to reach a point where we're going to create devastating consequences just the amount of soot and smoke in the air that can block the sun, huge agricultural destruction. Um, there was a study that was done probably about 10 years ago, and it was just an Indian-Pakistani nuclear exchange, where each side fired 50 nuclear weapons against 50 cities on the other side. And that basically devastated agriculture in the entire southern hemisphere for five to seven years. So yeah, I, I, one of the reasons I would like to see these weapons numbers reduced is because if we were so foolish to get into nuclear war, the lower numbers that were used, the better chance we have of you know somebody getting through it. Um, now there was at some point talk about, and part of I think is political, is that there's this view that we can't go much below the Russians for political reasons, and I'm not sure if that applies. Uh, if we have our own calculation of what we need to do. But I think above that, there is this feeling that, in part because of what we call extended deterrence. And this is where it's pretty easy, I think, for the United States to say to the Russians, if you use nuclear weapons against us, we will respond. That nuclear deterrence works. But the United States also has what we call extended nuclear deterrence. So we have a nuclear guarantee to our allies in NATO, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and others. And that's a little bit more difficult to make credible. It raised the question that I think the French posed it, would an American president really risk Chicago or Hamburg? Uh, but having those numbers politically may be necessary to persuade the Russians that yes, we are prepared if it comes to it to use nuclear weapons, not only to defend the United States, but also to defend our allies. And so I think those are some of the pressures that drive us to weapons levels that are larger than we need. And uh, again, I would hope that uh, when things settle down, we get back to a, a wiser course where probably at the end of the day, we're not going to be able to get to zero, which is by preference, but you can bring these numbers down so significantly. There's still, I think, a lot of room for reductions that would allow still countries to maintain a nuclear arsenal that could be the core of their security. Since you're talking about numbers, has anyone calculated uh, how many nuclear warheads it would take to make certain areas of the world, countries, uninhabitable, and for how long? 
Well, there were some discussions back in the 80s, I remember, about nuclear winter that at below a certain number, and I don't think they actually fixed that number, basically we could succeed in making uh, life, at least for humans, uh, impossible on the Earth. And I actually wonder if there would be some, you know, now with, you know, quantum computing, things like that, could you do calculations and come up with some number and say, you know, if you use X number of weapons, you basically uh, ended life on the planet. You know, if you had a number like that, that might be an incentive to kind of say, well, gee, we, you know, if that number is 700, we don't need 3,500 in the United States. Uh, but you know, I, I'm not sure that work has been done yet. But it might be a way to, I think, put a little bit of pressure on governments to take reductions a bit more seriously. Yes. Yeah, hello, sir. I was wondering if you could comment on uh, uh, the uh, Japan, Japan's role in nuclear deterrence, and specifically with the emphasis on the growing you know, nuclear threat from China. Yeah. Yeah, Japan comes comes under the American nuclear umbrella, uh, so we have uh, pledged uh, our nuclear deterrent to Japan's defense, uh, and they take it seriously. So, for example, uh, there has been talk in the past about withdraw. We have a small number of American nuclear weapons in Europe. There's been talk about bringing them home. That was about 10 to 15 years ago. And the Japanese were a little bit uncomfortable about that because they wanted to have an American capability to bring some nuclear weapons, not to Japan, but say to a place like Guam, as a signal of American readiness to defend Japan. Now Japan itself, as they have the three nuclear principles, you know, they will not have nuclear weapons. Although there has been some discussion in Japan about you know, can they rely on the United States? And some saying, can Japan be a nuclear weapon state? My guess is given Japan's history, probably not. But Japan probably right now is what you would, I would call a threshold nuclear weapon state. First of all, they have a space capability, and those missiles or the rockets can be used uh, for deliveries. So it's probably not to intercontinental ranges, but certainly to pay a range like North Korea. And they do have a fairly significant amount of, um, of plutonium that, that's been basically uh, coming out of reactors that, that could be reprocessed. And I, they certainly have the technical capabilities, the smarts to do it. So they have that situation. I think it's for historic reasons, Japan would not go there. Uh, South Korea, I mean, there, there's an actual dialogue in South Korea now where people would like American nuclear weapons, which were withdrawn from South Korea in 1992, to be reintroduced. And then some are saying that the Americans will not do that. We, South Korea, should develop our own nuclear weapons capability. I think in both cases, Washington probably has made clear to Japan and, and South Korea that if you develop your own nuclear weapons capability, that may be the end of the American commitment to your defense. Uh, because we're trying to keep the number of nuclear weapons states lower. Now, I think that makes a lot of sense, but I also think it you know, may not be a bad thing if you're sitting in China, where I think China has the greatest influence over North Korea. I don't mind the Chinese beginning to wonder, well, gee, would the South Koreans really go nuclear if North Koreans keep going? Maybe that gives the Chinese a greater incentive to do things that I think China could have done and has not done that might have pressured Mr. Kim to be a little bit more um, conservative about what he's doing in the nuclear area. Yeah, I may not have the courage to ask this question. Because it's somewhat off, it's de definitely off point. Okay. Uh, would you entertain an off point question? Sure. Uh, you have a lot of experience in Ukraine and recently visited. Uh, could you comment on the um, light? Who's, who's going to quit first? <laughs> the Russians, the Ukrainians, or NATO? Um. I think the Ukrainians see this war as existential. I think Ukrainians, and I'm not just talking about the government. I mean, the, the polls show this is like the view of 95% of Ukrainians. That if they lose this war, their democracy is gone, independent Ukraine is gone, that they're basically, uh, uh, they've been colonized again by Russia. And uh, I mean, one of the tragedies of this war, when I was there in the late 1990s, I would have said five to seven percent of Ukrainians are antagonistic towards Russians. Most were either well disposed, they had family members or friends in Russia, or they're agnostic. We now have, with, uh, there's a recent poll, what do you think of uh, Russians? 
2% in the Ukraine of the nuclear Russians. And it's not just Putin, it's, it's Russians. Um, so I think Ukraine is prepared to fight. I think actually if the West cut off weapons, it might come down to Molotov cocktails and rocks, but I think Ukraine is going to be fighting. And I, and I said it's one I like many. I underestimated Ukraine's military capability. If you'd asked me in February of 2020, I would have said, I expect the Russian military to win within a couple of months. But then Russia would be saddled with this decades long bloody insurgency where your Russian soldiers would be getting killed every week by snipers and things like that. So I think the Ukrainians are pretty set. On the Russian side, I think Putin is set. Putin at this point has, you know, by the one estimate report in the New York Times, 300,000 casualties, 120,000 Russian soldiers killed in action. You know, Putin, I don't think, can afford to lose this and still maintain his position. Uh, at this point, we don't see the Russian public turning against the war, but I have to wonder if you have this continuing flow of Russian body bags going back. At some point, does that erode the will of the public or the will of the elite to continue to the war? Does that, do they begin to turn against that? The question on the Ukrainian side is, I think the rules there, do they have the means? Are they going to have the capability? And, and they need the West for that. So I hope the West can sustain the flow of weapons. I think maybe we should be doing more. Uh, I, I give the Biden administration a lot of I think they have done some really excellent work in managing the diplomacy, keeping the West together. Um, the Biden administration will tell you they have two goals here. One is for Ukraine to win. The other is to avoid a Russia... NATO, Russian NATO military clash. Those are the right two goals. Where I would criticize the Biden administration, I think in in balancing the goals, they've been a bit too conservative. They've been a bit too cautious. And I'd like to see us doing more in certain weapon systems for the Ukrainians uh, that would give the Ukrainians the chance either to drive the Russians out or to deliver such a blow on the battlefield that, the, that Moscow would come around and negotiate a settlement on terms of Ukraine getting sent. Um, but I think, I, I think, like I said, I think the Ukrainians are fixed, Putin's fixed, the Russian population is so far fixed, but, you know, that may change. And I tend to worry more about the West. I, quite frankly, I worry about this country here. Uh, for 30 years, from my observation, Ukraine has enjoyed nonpartisan support, bipartisan support in Congress. Uh, the first time I worried about this last year, and I don't want to get political, but there's a minority, what I would call the MAGA wing of the Republican Party, that has now decided that it is not in America's interest to support Ukraine. I think that's wrong. And I do think that that election in 2024 could have some real consequences. And my guess is, one of the things that keeps Vladimir Putin playing is, he is saying, well, maybe there's a chance in 2024 we have a different American administration. And I think if the uh, former president were to return, my guess is that there would then be a very quick cut off of American assistance to Ukraine. And I think Mr. Putin is hoping for something like that. Last question here. Uh, in your vernacular, it appears that you are using weapon system and warhead interchangeably. But then you talked about having the warheads in storage. Sure. So are those on delivery vehicles? No. no. Um, we have. Uh, I forget what the number is. I think we had 14 to 50. Most of those are deployed words that are like intercontinental ballistic missiles or semi launched ballistic missiles. And then we count one of those for each deployed bomber. Right. But in a bomber base, um, the government really didn't say it, but I, could, I once did an apples and oranges, an oranges comparison, and I figured that uh, probably 10 years ago, and I guess it's about the same now, is that at the places where you have uh, deployed bombers, there's probably about five to six weapons in storage for each of those bombers. So when you say weapon, you mean the warhead? War, the warhead, yeah. Okay, yeah. all right, because yeah. in my vernacular, that, th those are very different. Right, right. And, and, and there's, in a lot of cases, I mean, you have warheads there, you're at the ballistic missile summoning bases, uh, there's believed to be a large facility down near Albuquerque where you have warheads just in storage areas. Uh, the warheads are maintained, they're, they're part of the active inventory. Right. And in fact, um, they could be returned to service fairly quickly, in part because the U.S. reached, got down to that 1,550 uh, limit, in a lot of cases, by taking warheads off of missiles. Mm 
So we now have, I think it's about 400 deployed Minuteman intercontinental ballistic missiles. Two thirds of those are capable of carrying three warheads. Each now carries one. But if a political decision was taken, they could put those warheads back on. Uh, it's the Trident II, which is our Soviet launched ballistic missile. It can carry eight warheads. On average, it carries four to five now. But there's warheads in storage. So that, again, this was the American preference was to have those reserve strategic warheads as a hedge against some political failure or a technological failure where you could actually return those warheads to existing missiles. How, how long would it take to uh, bring our ICBM force up to three warheads per missile? Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I've been told that the number of crews they can do is fairly limited. So my, my, what, what I can tell you is if we did it with missiles of proper, you know, all going through all the steps and all the safety measures, how long would it take? As opposed to if somebody said, we need those on that right now, you yeah. know how long can do it? And I, I just don't know, yeah. Thank you. Please help me to thank Steve Pfeiffer. So we'd like to give a little gift to all of our speakers, and uh, I'm hoping we haven't already given you one of these, but this is just a little token from us, a little paperweight to uh, in the globe with our logo on it, so. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, so we look forward to seeing all of you on September 7th for a program with Steve Sokol, who is the president of the American Council on Germany on the topic Germany's new foreign and security policy. Also, if you are a member, please look forward to the next World Affairs Council colleagues meeting with our very own president, Carl Schneider. Uh, on a program entitled Turkey, Always at a Crossroads, and that'll be Tuesday, September 19th at Patty Jewett. The next book club meeting is on Wednesday, September 13th. That's the evening club, and I'm not sure, does anyone have any information on the daytime club? I don't have that right at hand, but should be in the next newsletter, actually. I know it was in the newsletter. So for registration for this and other events, please refer to our most recent email at our website at csworldfairs.org, and we will see you September 7th. Thank you. Thank you.